All right. We're live. So there's still a there's still a black box, but it's now in the upper right hand corner. Now it's gone. Right, right. Are we live, Sam? I'm going to mute myself. Okay. Yeah, we should be live. Okay. Hello, my name is Chris Malati. I'm the vice president of the board of directors of the Cascade Mycological Society here in Eugene, Oregon. And um, tonight we're uh, thrilled to have two of our local mycological experts um, who contributed to the Mount Pisgah Arboretum Mushroom Show virtual event this year. Um, allow us to show those event videos in this time and space. And first up of the two presenters tonight is Dr. Rue Vandergrift. Um, Rue is a queer scientist and illustrator. He received his doctorate in mycology from the U University of Oregon here in Eugene, um, the U of O's Institute of Ecology and Evolution. And he did a whole lot of his dissertation work on the Xylaria uh, genus in Los Cedros, Ecuador. And in fact, he's right there right now in Ecuador. So he won't be joining us tonight for questions after his video. Um, he's published in peer-reviewed research journals, um, and currently he's working on a National Geographic Explorer grant to coordinate a multidisciplinary international expedition to expand the knowledge and biodiversity of the Los Cedros Biological Reserve. And, exciting too, he's um, currently the producer for a forthcoming documentary film called Marrow of the Mountain, about the mining um, issues and the conservation uh, issues in Ecuador. So uh, we're thrilled to have Dr. Rue Vandergroof um, with this video on scientific um, illustration. And he's illustrating a species of mushroom called the fairy ring mushroom occurs in lawns. And that actual art piece that he's doing will be up for sale and the information will follow that video. So let's hear from Dr. Rue Vandergriff on scientific illustration of the fairy ring mushroom. Thanks, Rue. Over to you, Sandy. Hello, I'm Dr. Rue Vandergriff, and today we're going to be talking about the process of scientific illustration. We're working with this beautiful mushroom, Marasmius oreades. Uh, which is also known as the fairy ring mushroom. It's a relatively common lawn mushroom here in the Pacific Northwest and down through California. Now, when you're preparing your scientific illustration, it, it's really important to study your specimen pretty carefully. Um, remember, we're, you know, part of the goal here is art, but, you know, the other part is an accurate representation of the specimen in question. Um, you know, we're going to be utilizing tools and techniques that will allow us to communicate not just a pretty picture of a mushroom, but, you know, a, a representation of that mushroom that will let someone else be able to identify it, uh, you know, based on the drawing. So we want to pay particular attention to the key identifying features for whatever the mushroom it is that you are trying to depict. Uh, and so in this case, with our fairy ring mushroom, you know, there's a couple of things that, that we're gonna wanna make sure we represent accurately. Uh, you know, the attachment of the gills, uh, color gradation here, we'll be making a black and white drawing, uh, but we do still have some very obvious light and dark zonation on this mushroom. In particular, you know, the stem is quite dark compared to the, the cap, compared to the gills. And the stem is quite dark, but it does fade to white up at the top where it attaches to the cap. So we're going to want to make sure we represent that accurately. Uh, we also have this kind of dark zone around the edge of the cap. Um, and this is a result in this case, I think, of the, you know, the caps drying out a little bit. Uh, but it's still something we'll want to depict. 
at first, we're going to want to plan our drawing. Um, and when you're working with ink, uh, it's always a good idea to start with a pencil and plan your drawing carefully. You know, a pencil you can always undo. You know, you, can, you have an eraser, you have the ability to kind of walk backwards, try things out, try them again if they don't work. But once you put ink to paper, uh, that's it. The ink is permanent. This mushroom, or Asmius aureates, is often called the fairy ring mushroom. It's a common lawn mushroom. You find it in grassy lawns, particularly water lawns, all over the west coast. Uh, and it's also quite variable. And so we're going to take our mechanical paper, our mechanical pencil here, and you know very carefully plan out our drawing. You know what angle do we want to view this mushroom from? Um, and do we need any details? And so, you know, for example, I think for this drawing, I'd like to have some uh, side, little side images that depict some specific details. Uh, in particular, we have r different ranks of gill in this mushroom. Uh, so you can see there's gills that run all the way from the stipe to the edge of the cap, but there are also gills uh, that are free, you know, what we call secondary gills or tertiary gills, that don't run all the way to the stipe. They start at the edge of the cap and then they stop at about halfway or about a third of the way, depending on which rank. Uh, and you know, that's a, a way for the mushroom to be able to more efficiently fill the space. Uh, so you don't end up with a lot of wasted space out near the cap and really crowded gills down near the stipe. So we'll start planning that a little bit. And then uh, once we've got our, our plan on paper with pencil, we can start working uh, with the ink. Uh, I like to use Pigma Micron pens. Uh, these are waterproof, uh, fine liners. They make a very consistent line width. Uh, so you can have multiple different pens that have different line widths. It's very useful to have different line widths as you're working. You can use the weight of a line to help give three dimensionality to your drawing. A thicker line on one side will imply a shadow and will imply a three-dimensional structure. Uh, and so we'll work with that as we go. Um, I also like to start with areas of the drawing that the detail work is slightly less critical. Uh, so in this case, I'm starting with the lower stipe where we've got, you know, some debris from where we pulled it out of this grassy field. And one of the things that's really interesting to me about the fairy ring mushroom is the way its edibility is treated in different guidebooks. Listen to what David Aurora has to say about the edibility of Merasmius aureates in 1986, when the, the second edition of this book was published. He says, it's delectably delicious. One of the few LBMs, that's little brown mushrooms, worth learning. What it lacks in substance, it makes up for in abundance. Discard the tough stems and use the caps whole. They're superb in just about anything. Now compare that to what Noah Siegel and Christian Schwartz say in Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast, which was published in 2016. Edible and good, but not recommended, as it often grows in areas treated with herbicides or polluted by urban emissions. I think there's something to be learned about the way that urban landscapes have changed since Aurora was writing in the middle 80s. You know, the regular use of pesticides and the pollution present in urban landscapes uh, is a real issue. Um, we, we think about conservation and, um, you know, a love of nature, and we think about these beautiful, pristine, unspoiled places. We think about our national parks and our national forests. Uh, but the urban landscape and the nature that exists around us where we live is extremely important as well. This is the nature we're most likely to interact with. The mushrooms we're most likely to find are the ones growing, you know, in our lawns and, and around our houses. I think it's something that we as a society should be keeping in mind. You know, we are profoundly affected by the natural context within which we are embedded. Uh, the more deeply we're engaged with the nature around us, the more likely we are to actively seek the preservation and conservation of that nature. And that can only be a good thing.
we're going to be using a technique called stippling to provide the value variation, the shading and the shadow on our drawing. Stippling is a really interesting technique um, of using individual small single dots to, to help add uh, color, to add value to the drawing. The more densely packed the dots are on the paper, the darker the total value. Uh, it's kind of similar to um, you know, the way newspaper, black and white newspaper photographs are printed, where they're composed of lots of dots. Um, of course, in a black and white newspaper, the size of the dot changes. Uh, in stippling, usually the size of the dot remains constant. And this is a technique that dates back to uh, the early days of printing. Photographs were very difficult to reproduce in the early days of printing processes, uh, but you could transfer a drawing like this onto a lithographic plate and reproduce it with a printing press. Now the problem is when you resize a drawing, if your shading is accomplished with hatching and cross-hatching uh, with lines, when you scale down that drawing, uh, the weight of those lines uh, disappears. And it's very difficult to have a, a line drawing that scales with the value uh, being true to the original. But stippling was a technique because these are individual dots of, of black on the paper. Uh, when you scale up or down from a stippled drawing, the gradients of value remain pretty constant. And so this was a technique that was developed to help scientific reproduction of images uh, in the early days of printing. Now, of course, we're using the stippling to represent the shading, the, uh, you know, the shadow and the highlights on our drawing, but we're also using it to represent the change in value, the change in darkness of our subject, kind of regardless of the shadows. And so we have this dark colored stipe, so we're going to want to first put in a, um, a pretty even layer of stippling across the whole stipe. Uh, and then we're going to want to go from there, fill it in darker for the shadows. Now, on the cap, you know, the gills on this mushroom are, are pretty bright. They're very white, um, as you can see from, from these close-up images. But they're also shadowed in between the gills. Even though the gills on this mushroom are relatively uh, well-spaced, uh, they're still pretty closely packed together, uh, which means that there's deep shadows in between them. And so we can represent this by taking this hard edge that we've drawn for the edge of the gill and then adding stippling to the, the outer edge to represent the shadow on the next gill in the series. And so we can see that as we, as we go through uh, the cap of the mushroom, we add stippling uh, starting at the hard edge of the previous gill and fading out uh, to the next gill, leaving a white band before we get to the hard line that we've drawn to represent the edge of the gill. And this gives us that appearance of shadows in between the gills. And of course, it's most difficult here in the center um, where we have to represent those gills being kind of head on. we also want to represent the three-dimensionality of the stipe. Uh, the stalk on this particular mushroom is flattened and has this kind of uh, indented area on the flat side. And so we're representing the mushroom with the stalk kind of coming out of the paper. So we want to be careful about the shadows and the shadow of this sort of indented zone. And of course, we want to make sure that we have our stippling uh, providing an even, smooth texture. Uh, people go about this in lots of ways. Some people very carefully and mechanically put down their, you know, their first layer of stipples in a very even, evenly spaced regimen. Uh, and so they apply a, almost a, a geometric patterning of stipples to apply that first layer of value to kind of darken a stipe. I personally like to take a slightly more randomized approach. I think it gives you a little bit more uh, of a smooth surface texture, and it's not distracting. You know, the human brain is very good at pulling patterns out of chaos. And so if you use patterns 
uh, to provide a base layer of value to your drawing, the, you know, the eye that's seeing it will, will detect that pattern sometimes before it detects the, you know, the value um, you know, this kind of smooth value tone that you're trying to apply. And that can be distracting. We wanted to add some little um, detail drawings uh, beside the main drawing here. Uh, in particular, I want to add this drawing where we can see the ranks of the gills looking sort of straight down the cap. Uh, so I've taken one mushroom and I've pulled the stem off of it, like you would for a spore print, uh, so that I can look down into the gills. Um, and remember, don't be afraid to get close to what you're doing. And when you're planning a new detail drawing, don't forget to come back to your pencil so that you have this uh, underlying basis, this plan for your drawing before you go back to the ink pen. Double check everything carefully. Make sure that the drawing looks the way you want it to look. Um, and then go back to your ink pen. Because remember, the ink is permanent. So check everything closely, get close to it, use your eyes. You know, this is a very small mushroom that we're drawing here. So, you know, we have to get really close to it. Um, I have a hand lens that I like to use, uh, as well as a dissecting microscope, which of course I'm, we're not showing for this drawing, but uh, a dissecting microscope can be extremely useful if you want to really explore the finest of fine details in a drawing and really draw something blown up much larger than life size. And so for the, the close-up of the gill surface here, um, I'm drawing both hard lines on both sides of the gills because when we look down at the mushroom, we see the gill uh, as almost a thick white line with deep shadows in between the gills. So I'm going to demarcate the part of the gill blade that will remain white, um, and then I'm going to add the shadows later. Uh, I've also broken off the stem here with a knife, um, and you can look down into the center of the stem and see that it is uh, not quite hollow, but it's full of a looser, pithier mycelium, a looser, pithier hyphae. Uh, so we're representing that uh, very gently um, with uh, some darker lines here in the center. Um, I also want to add another detailed drawing uh, that really clearly shows the way that the gills attach to the stipe, uh, because it's an important identifying character for this particular mushroom. So again, we go back to our pencil for planning these small side drawings. Don't, don't be afraid to use your eraser. Plan things out, make some changes, um, decide how you want it to look, uh, play with the composition on the paper. Right? You know, we're not just making this drawing uh, you know, to represent the mushroom. Uh, we're also rep making this drawing because it's beautiful. Um, and I particularly, one of the reasons that I enjoy scientific illustration like this is because I, I do think it is a style of art um, that really speaks to me. It speaks to my love of precision. It really, um, you know, it, it it's a style that uh, I think is underappreciated in the, the modern world. Uh, I've been to a handful of, of art exhibits, of uh, showings of, of scientific illustrations, uh, and, and it moves me. You know, the accurate representation of the natural world um, still has an enormous amount of space for artistic freedom of expression and creativity. You know, everything about the layout and the, the, the composition of this drawing is art, right? And so as we get closer to these little side drawings, um, you know, we want to, again, represent the shadows between the gills. And we, we do this in the same way as we did on the larger drawing, but we have a little bit more space to work with here. And so you can really see the gradient of the stippling here uh, a little bit more clearly than you can on the major drawing. And so we just want to, you know, always go back to the model, go back to the mushroom that you're looking at uh, and make sure that you're representing the light and the shadow as well as you can. 
Uh, of course, we also have a little bit of darkening uh, right under the pileus, the, the top of the cap. Uh, there's kind of a layer, so we add that. Uh, and again, on this close-up, you can see this pithy interior to the stock. Once you've got most of your ink down on paper, wait for things to dry a little bit, uh, and then you'll want to erase the pencil that you put down as your initial planning layer out from underneath of your ink drawing. You want to be very gentle. I like to use a kneaded rubber eraser for this because it doesn't really take away any of the ink and it doesn't, you know, some erasers really grip the paper and will actually take off the first layer of whatever paper you're working with uh, or will, you know, rip and tear the fibers of the paper, uh, which can make it much harder to continue working on a drawing after you've applied the eraser to it uh, and uh, it can smear or remove some of the ink from your drawing. The kneaded rubber eraser is a really great uh, gentle eraser for this kind of technical work. And so once you've taken away the pencil from underneath of your drawing, you're going to want to step back, have a good close look at it, um, and you'll probably realize that there are some places where the value uh, just isn't quite where you wanted it to be, where you were seeing the darkness of the pencil underneath contributing to the gradient of, of light and dark in your drawing. So once you've removed the pencil, you're going to want to go back and clean up the drawing. Uh, you know, put the lot, you know, Darken up some of the lines, maybe take one of your thicker pointed pens and really use the line weight to give you that value that we were talking about, that three dimensionality, where if you have thicker lines in some places and thinner lines in others, it can help you create this three dimensional structure. Uh, and then you're going to want to use stippling again to really fill in the shadows. Uh, once you've erased the pencil, you can really see whether or not your drawing is starting to look three-dimensional in the way you want it to be. You know, it's really easy to overdo it uh, and fill in particularly on things like this dark stock and forget that there are highlights. And so you want to make sure you leave some paler places uh, to really depict those highlights. Uh, and I think that'll about do it. And so that'll be all today for uh, scientific illustration. Uh, I'm Dr. Rue, and I hope to see you again very soon. Have a good night. Well, thank you so much, um, Rue, Dr. Rue Vandergriff. And as you see on the screen now, that original illustration of the Merasmus Oriades um, is available for a $100 donation to the documentary that Rue is working on now. Um, so thanks again to Rue Vandergriff for that uh, piece on scientific illustration it was fascinating. I've seen it before, but it was really amazing to see it a second time. I'm always blown away by people with um, uh, artistic ability and Rue was able to, to bring that mushroom alive in um, just a few minutes with uh, pencil and pen. Thank you, Rue. Um, next up is our own Cheshire Marison. Uh, Cheshire is the current president of the board of directors of the Mass Cascade Mycological Society. She's also one of the founding members, and she can often be found, always be found, at the lichen display at the Mount Pisgah Arboretum Mushroom Festival. Um, and through that lichen display, uh, on behalf of the Northwest Lichenologist, Cheshire became interested in using lichens and subsequently mushrooms to dye uh, wool and yarn to make um, items, including hats and scarves, which um, she'll talk about in the uh, video today. Um, she's become quite a local expert over the last decade on dyeing with mushrooms and lichens. And she also often offers classes on using mushrooms and lichens for dyeing through the uh, Eugene Textile Center. And she often 
uh, in non-pandemic times <laughs> can be found at multiple mushroom festivals throughout the Northwest uh, giving talks on um, dying with mushrooms. So um, without further ado, um, please, uh, and, uh, we'll introduce um, Cheshire's video in a moment. I just wanted to let you know that uh, unlike Rue, who's in Ecuador, Cheshire is here in Eugene and she will be able to answer questions. So you can use the chat function to ask her questions. Without further ado, Cheshire on dying with me. Hi, my name is Cheshire Marison and I dye wool and silk using mushrooms. And I'm here to show you some of the beautiful colors I've gotten. So one of my favorites is this purple from Haplopilus nigillans. And Haplopilus is a little tiny um, soft conch you find on the coast and in California, and it gives you these be beautiful purple. So this is one of my favorite mushroom dye colors. Another of my absolute favorite mushrooms to dye with is Feola schwannitziana. That's called butt rot. If you talk to a forester, it's a butt rot. If you talk to a dyer, it's dyer's polypore. If you talk to just other people, it gets called cow pie mushroom, but Feola schwannitziana. And it makes a variety of yellows, golds, and greens. And I'll show you some of the variety. So this hat really does a good job of capturing some of the variety of golds and greens you can get. So this is, this is Feola, the yellow is Feola Schwanitzii, and the green is Feola Schwanitzii with iron added to the dye bath. So gold and green. Here's the green again that you get when you add iron to the dye bath. And here's another great example of the yellow you get just from boiling it up, and the green you get from adding iron to the dye bath. So, my favorite friend, Feola Schwanitzia. Oh, and then Feolus on silk gets really, can be really fun. So, this is actually two mushrooms together dyed. So, the yellow on this silk shirt is Feolus. And then I tie dyed it and over dyed it with Pisolithus tinctorius. This dead man's foot is really ugly um, puffballs you find around town and in the woods. They like to grow on the edge of roads. So, and it makes this beautiful dark brown on silk. And I have another, and it makes this really brassy, kind of goldish brown on again on silk and then and the color will vary by the silk because here's another one that was done like this where it was first dyed with Feolus to make the yellow then I tie dyed it and wrapped each piece in plastic to keep the uh, Pisolithus from penetrating and you get this sort of this one's almost more brassy orange and so it depend. the colors can depend on the silk and the wool. So once again, Feolus and Pisolithus. Oh, and here's some more, here's a great example of the Feolus where I did it first with soup, with very young ones and got this beautiful, beautiful, almost chrome yellow. And then I used an older uh, sporocarp and got this beautiful yellow gold. So, Feolus. So then, moving on to some other species. Another one I really like to work with that is a real nuisance to work with is the Indian paint fungus, the uh, Echinodontium tinctorium. You'll find this growing at high elevations. You can see where a branch came out and it grows on the underside of the branch. It is wood. It is just wood. So I, uh, to make dye from it, I, saw, I pound it to powder with a sledgehammer and then the dye, the color in it is not water soluble. So I soak it in isopropyl alcohol for a couple weeks and then I'll dilute that dye bath 
and I can get these beautiful orange kind of ochre colors on silk and on wool, but I really love what it does on silk. Oh, and I forgot to show you Pisolithus on wood. So this beautiful brown is the color you get from this on, on wool. Another favorite mushroom of mine to dye with is the lobster mushroom. It's also one of my favorite mushrooms to eat and you have the advantage of when you go out hunting lobster mushrooms, you often find a lot of oldy moldy kind of gross ones. Well, you can dye with them. So it makes these beautiful pinks and oranges and you have to raise the pH so when you're using them you'll actually add some ammonia to the cooking water and it extracts more colors and the color goes from a pale peach to this orange color and sometimes if you're really lucky you'll even get sort of almost a grape kool-aid color and this scarf here is lobster mushroom hypomyces lactiflorum is the more pink color and the more orange was a, i dipped one end of the bundle of yarn into Cortinaria smithiana to get these colors. And then let's not forget Cortinaria smithiana, which to me is one of the prized colors by dyer, mushroom dyers, because you can get pinks and oranges and reds depending on, and it depends on the yarn, depends on the batch. It's really, not consistent, which is both frustrating and fun. So the Dermosibes, all the colored guild Cortinarius, whether they're yellow, orange, or red, will dye yarn, but the red ones are the real prized ones. So here we've got the red of the Cortinarius smithii, and you can see the lovely orangey pink from the Hypomyces. And then from there, I use a variety, the grays and greens, these particular hats are a real mix. It's uh, a lot of it is done with sarcodons, which make beautiful, which are really kind of iffy. Sometimes you get brown, sometimes you get a blue green. And you have to raise the pH when you use it by adding ammonia, but the color, boy, it's really iffy. It depends on the age of the mushroom, the mushroom itself, so, but it's worth it because sometimes you get these amazing blue greens. And here's an example of a scarf. This is all Sarcodon, oops, Sarcodon Fusco Indicus. So with the pH uh, raised using ammonia, I got this beautiful light blue. Without altering the pH, I got this dark army green. So you can play with the chemistry of it. And it's kind of like cooking and it's kind of chemistry and you get and the great thing about it for me is when I go out mushrooming, I feel like I rarely get skunked because even if I don't find things to eat, I find species I can die with. So today I'm going to show you how to do mushroom dyeing using Feola schwannitzii, also known as the dyer's polypore. If you're a forester, it's known as butt rot or velvet top or cow pie mushroom. And from this, by co cooking this mushroom up, we can get these beautiful colors. We can get this lovely yellow, this beautiful green by adding ferrous sulfate or iron to our dye bath, or, and depending on the age of the mushroom, we could get this lovely gold. So the video that follows is a compressed version of mushroom dyeing, because typically I will mordant the yarn, prepare the yarn the day before, and then cook the mushrooms up and do the dyeing that day. So it typically takes, oh, once you have the prepared yarn, it's a couple of hours, but it's totally worth it for the colors you get. So when you're dyeing with mushrooms, a very important part of doing the dye work is to weigh your yarn in advance because that's what determines how much uh, mordant we'll use, oops, sorry, and how much mushrooms we'll use. So we're gonna weigh this little ball of yarn and you can see it's approximately 13 
grams and I prefer to weigh things in grams because I find it's easier to do the math. So when we're dying with mushrooms, a really important step is to pre-treat your yarn using alum. So an alum is what's considered a mordant and it basically opens up the individual pieces of the fiber so that it can absorb more of the dye. And you'll get much more brilliant colors if you use alum and you'll be happier with the results. So I prefer to mordant in advance of the dyeing. So at this point, we're gonna weigh, we've decided we have 13 grams of yarn. So we need, this scale only measures in whole grams. So we're gonna just use two grams of alum. And it's a pretty small amount. So that's it. All right, so we've got our alum weighed and now we'll add it to the pot. So next we take our weighed alum and you can see we have a small amount of yarn, so it's a small amount of alum. And we're just gonna pour it in the pot and give it a good stir to be sure that it is dissolved. And this is a dark bottom pot so I can see that the alum disappears. And it's just an aluminum salt so it dissolves fairly quickly. And then from there we take our wetted yarn and we add it to the pot and now next we'll go and we'll take it over to the stove and cook it for about an hour at a simmer so 160 to 180 you don't want to ever boil yarn you can ruin it and I cook it for an hour at 160 to 180 degrees Fahrenheit and then I cool it in the alum bath typically I let it cool overnight so our next step is to get our mushrooms ready. And today we're gonna to use this Veil Schwinitzia that's been dried. And this was picked when it was very young and yellow, but it dried to this brown. And we will need to use approximately at least the same amount of mushroom as we had yarn. And we had 13 grams of yarn, so we need 13 grams or more and it's best to break it up as small as you can manage. So there's 18. That's plenty good. Having a little extra doesn't hurt. And then we'll take this mushroom and we can either throw it right in the pot, but to get the most color out of it, it helps if you soak it overnight. And here's the same mushroom soaked overnight just in a jar of water. And this will dump into a pot and this will become our dye bath. So the next step in dyeing is we will take our jar of weighed mushrooms that we know we've got at least 13 grams of mushrooms that we've soaked overnight. And you can see we already have great color. So we're gonna just dump them in a pot, turn the stove on and cook these for an hour. And you can see the pieces, you can see we've already got some great color. And with faeolus, you can boil these. You can just let the mushrooms boil for an hour or they need to be simmered at, or let them cook at at least 180 degrees. For other mushroom species, if you're working with gilled mushrooms, you need to keep the temperature under 160. If you're working with the tooth fungi like uh, sarcodons, you can boil them. So don't be afraid. So we'll need to boil this for an hour. Our mushrooms have been cooking for an hour and they're ready for us to make into our dye bath. So we want to strain the mushrooms out of our dye bath because that way we won't have dark blotchy spots where the mushrooms come in contact with our fiber and we won't have a lot of junk to clean out of the yarn. So I just use a big kitchen strainer over my pot and you can see the beautiful color we're getting. And there we go. So now we're ready to add our yarn and I'm just going to grab the yarn that I've got down here 
that is already in a big pot of hot water and it's approximately the same temperature as the dye bath is right now. If you, and you can see that the yarn is already picking up some color. If you add cold yarn to a hot dye bath, the yarn can shrink and felt. So you definitely want to try to get the temperature of the dye bath and the temperature of the water that your yarn is sitting in about the same. So our dye bath for the Phaeolus mushroom has been cooking for an hour and you could see that we now have this beautiful yellow. And this was done from a very young mushroom or sporocarp that was bright yellow. And so we got this beautiful bright yellow color. This other pot is really interesting in the sense that this was an older mushroom that I used and you can see we're getting more of a beautiful gold color. And when we get this beautiful gold color, if we add some iron to the dye bath, we often will get a really lovely green. So we'll do that next. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take some of our beautiful gold colored yarn and we're gonna turn it green using iron. So first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna put some iron in this pot and you have to be careful when you're using iron because it can contaminate things. So if you get it in your pots, you could have things get changed to color you don't want. So I keep a pot dedicated for iron and labeled. So we're gonna use some iron powder, some ferrous sulfate, which essentially is rust. And you can buy ferrous sulfate at gardening supply stores, websites that cater to dyers, or uh, compounding pharmacies. So I want the change to be pretty dramatic. So I'm going to add a gram. I know I use this spoon a lot and I know how much each of the sides is. So I'm going to throw a gram, which is a pretty small amount, into that pot. And then I don't really feel like using our entire dye bath. I kind of want to keep some so I can do some more dyeing with it later. And I'm just gonna pour some of our dye into this pot. And I'm gonna put that on the heat and it's already turned dark. And I'm going to take my, and we're gonna take the yarn out of this bag. And we're just gonna dunk it in there and it typically takes a few minutes for the dye magic to start happening where you can see instantly it's already turning dark and it'll take just a couple minutes for it to turn green. So our beautiful yellow yarn has been in the dye pot with the iron for just a couple of minutes and you can see that it has turned green. So here we go, we, we're getting two colors out of one dye bath by adding iron. So that was mushroom dyeing in a nutshell. As you see, it's uh, some chemistry, it's a little weighing, it's definitely some cooking. And then you end up with these beautiful colors at the end.
Okay, Cheshire. <laughs> Are you ready for questions? Yes, I'm ready for questions. Great. So the qu first question is, do you sell your stuff? <laughs> I do typically. I have brought uh, hats and other things to our November and December meetings and sold them there. But you can also contact me. You could just send me a, an email at president at the president um, a president at cascademyco.org and then we can start a conversation and I can send you pictures of what I have for sale. Okay, and Biddy Roy has a question. Uh, that was that question was from Erica Houston, by the way. And Biddy Roy's question is the hypomyces die fussy about the age of the fungus. Can I use lobster that I would, would not eat? Well, that's what I do. I eat the nice ones and the old grody ones are what I use for dyeing. So I actually find the older and the grodier that they are, the more red I get can actually extract from them. Okay. I'm waiting for other questions. First of all, I do have to apologize. I did cut your head off a few times in that video. <laughs> yeah, <you did. laughs> but, but it was certainly fun doing. I'll never forget. I, I think that's the third or fourth time I've watched that video. It's just fun to watch every time. Yeah, I so, really like it. Yeah. And it was funny that the, as soon as we sh I showed up to film this, her neighbor started mowing his lawn. <laughs> so, <laughs> <I remember> that. <laughs> it's like no <laughs> so but otherwise I, we did pretty good for a bunch of amateurs it's obvious that that rue is a, a producer he he did a, a little bit better <laughs> well, <laughs> if i can interject too um not only is he a producer but he did that drawing while he was on a zoom meeting discussing other stuff i mean that's you know not only is the art amazing right he was yeah, multitasking he, while he was doing the art so yeah, and he, by the way cheshire this is the second time i've seen your video on dying i watched it during the pisca arboretum mushroom festival and i learned something new each time it was really well done Thank you. Oh, so I guess Biddy noticed that we were outside when we were doing this video. Was that for sunlight purposes or do you usually die outside? I prefer to die outside because especially when you're adding ammonia to things, it is very too stinky to do in the house. And I started with lichen dyeing and a lot of lichens, when you cook them up, are really stinky, like low tide on a hot day. So I started dying outside. And I pretty much do it outside because it's smelly. I, if I could interject, um, my lovely wife, Molly, had a hand-dyed, handmade wedding dress. And that producer did their dying outside as well and it, it was with commercial dyes not <laughs> stinky mushroom one, ones um and i must say cheshire uh, i don't know about the ammonia but those stanky lobster mushrooms i don't know how you get them home they are so bad smelling i i i bring well usually you know i leave them in a basket in the trunk so that I don't have to smell them. And then sometimes I bring giant, like gallon plastic jars and just throw them in there so that I don't have to smell them. But yeah, they are skanky. It's all about the planning then, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do we do have, any, have any further questions for Cheshire? Not right now. I just, I just want to comment that the colors, when you see mushroom dyed, fibers in person. They are just absolutely 
gorgeous. It is just so different than a synthetic dye. It's just, it's just really, really I beautiful. I have a question for Cheshire. Yes. Um, I don't know anything about dyeing and fabric stuff, but I have t-shirts that have been like sitting in the sun and they faded where the sun hits them and then the other side is darker. Do you do, does that happen with mushroom dyed objects? It can where, cause no, I'm, I mean, there are some dyes that are truly color fast and, but the, the mushroom dyes, it, some dyes are fade more than others. Uh, they can fade over time. I have had like hats that I wear skiing in the sun that do get faded. But what I really discovered helps keep them, keeping them from fading is when you're not wearing them to put them away in a drawer where they're out of the light as much as possible. And that preserves the colors for as long as possible. Good, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Does anyone have any other questions on YouTube? If you do. Now's your chance. Speaker now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's uh, say goodbye. Uh, uh, yeah, and I guess we, we didn't really do any announcements, but I don't think we have any, do we? Nope. Well, the only announcement I'd like to interject is we may have, a, other than the scheduled speaker, which we have for January, uh, Mike Bug, Dr. Mike okay. Bug, Professor Emeritus of Evergreen University, um, his book, which he will be talking about, um, the publication date has been pushed back. I, I would imagine it's due to the pandemic. So we may try to um, find a substitute speaker for January so that Dr. Bug can, what he wants to do is be able to speak about his book when the book is actually available. <laughs> so oh. we may move him back a month or two, but uh, he's on the agenda and we may have um, Daniel Winkler, I'm waiting to, to hear from him. Um, he's, I believe he's president of the Puget Sound Mycological Society and um, owner of the Mushrooming Travel Service, where the, um, which probably is on hold at the moment. But um, yeah, upcoming speakers, stay tuned. Thank you, Cheshire. Um, Thank you, Sandy, for all your technical expertise. We couldn't do this without you. Well, and at least you. we got on YouTube this time. <laughs> <Not too much. laughs> and thank you to all those long suffering people who have sat there and watched us. Um, thanks for participating and um, look, check in our website for who's speaking one month from today. Um, happy mushrooming. <laughs>